Part 4. Singapore and other minor states. With few exceptions, democracy has not brought good government to new developing countries. What Asians value may not necessarily be what Americans or Europeans value. Westerners value the freedoms and liberties of the individual. As an Asian of Chinese cultural background, my values are for a government which is honest, effective and efficient. That was Lee Kuan Yew, the founder of Singapore, in 1992. So when Lee gives that quote about democracy, he clearly has in mind his neighbouring country Malaysia, which the wealthier Chinese minority broke away from in the 1960s to found Singapore and established itself as a trading port under a basically a British colonial model that had already governed it for the previous century and a half. So Malaysia under British rule had seen the importation of Chinese migrants to work in various industries like mining and also Indian immigrants to do the same thing. Um, and this would form the basis of materials that could be traded out of the port city of Singapore. And this added ethnic groups into Malaysia, which already had a, a dominant Muslim population who had settled in the 11th century, displacing the Sarawakis and other ethnic groups who live in Borneo. Uh, when Malaysia became independent, it adopted a constitution along ethnic lines, which ensure that the country's leader has to be a Muslim and an ethnic Malay. The other two democratic parties in Malaysia are ethnic parties dominated by the Chinese and the Indians, and all that happens is that these parties, these parties never win, and they only ever advocate for their ethnic group. And although the Malays are an ethnic majority in Malaysia, the other minorities have to pay taxes and affirmative action towards them because they're less prosperous. And so while Malaysia is nominally a democracy, um, for a long time it was very ineffective and pretty much unable to function as one, and it only became ranked as democratic uh, by most researchers in 2014. And so this was clearly what Lee Kuan Yew was hoping to avoid when he founded Singapore. Um, because he, he said several times that if he created democracy in Singapore, the Chinese would want one thing, the Indians would want another, the Muslims would want another, and nothing would get done. And so he was content to allow some democratic reforms, which involved legislative elections in the 1980s, and he was happy to allow other political parties to be created. But the ruling political party, the People's Action Party, um, has remained in power ever since. Um, and uses basically draconian anti-defamation laws to punish other political activists or protesters who try and challenge it. Uh, when Deng Xiaoping visits Lee Kuan Yew in Singapore for the first time in 1978, um, he was, was blown away by the massive differences between the living standards in China and in Singapore. And he complains to Lee that China was so vast and complicated, um, well, Singapore was basically just a city, so that China could never develop in the same way that Singapore had. Um, but to Lee, this was just excuse-making, and he tells Deng that there's nothing that Singapore has done that China could not do. And this clearly had an effect on Deng, because just a year later, he embarks on his reform and opening up policy, which allows foreign investment into China to develop many cities around China, including Shenzhen, Shanghai, Xiamen, and they go on eventually to become the most prosperous cities in China today. And in the 1990s, Singapore would become seen as a model by a new generation of Chinese leaders. And around 22,000 Chinese officials were reportedly sent to study its political model. And they're mostly concerned with how to develop China, or, or how the country was able to achieve rapid growth, but managed to keep one political party in total control. Um, and these same methods were basically used to create the growth of Shanghai and Shenzhen in the 90s into major economic cities. Um, and this faction within the Chinese government developed into a group uh, called the Shanghai Clique, basically led by Zhu Rongji and Jiang Zemin and people like that. Even Xi Jinping, when he first came into power, he often praised the Singapore model of good governance. And he actually based his own programs of anti-corruption and strengthening the rule of law uh, on Singapore.
and went around emphasizing the strength of Asian values in creating good economic systems, which was sort of part of a it's that's part of the whole CCP's pivot into embracing Confucianism and Chinese culture. However, on closer inspection, one will see that the Chinese emulation of Singapore is fairly superficial, and that the CCP only really sees what it wants to see in Singapore. Um, because the whole idea of a Singaporean model has pretty much fallen by the wayside, because in Singapore in 2011, it allowed uncontested elections, and a majority of Singaporeans were allowed to vote for the first time. Um, and although, because of this, um, the legal system, uh, they didn't win very many seats, but they actually uh, allowed p seats uh, to, be, to be won by other parties, and pretty much set up like the Westminster system in many other British colonies, former British colonies. And so um, Singapore has moved over time more and more in the direction of greater political freedom and more democracy and free speech, um, while China has moved in the exact opposite direction, curtailing free speech, shutting down NGOs and abolishing term limits. Um, and so apart from a few dozen window cities like Beijing, Shanghai and Shenzhen, there's very little else that China has really learned from Singapore. I mean, they completely failed to recognise that Singapore's strength, just like in Hong Kong, lay in its very rigorous and independent legal system that has a, a large emphasis on property rights. I mean, anyone who's lived in China will know that the law is very much just a guideline. It's sort of just made up um, and, is, and is very not consistently enforced, which is, is one of the main problems in China. And so because the legal system is, is independent from the executive, it's able to balance out the, the kind of ambitions of the executive branch. And because of these structural problems, uh, Xi's anti-corruption campaign has been a complete failure. I mean, China is actually ranked as more corrupt than it was when Xi first came to power in 2012. And so any move towards openness or allowing political oppos opposition is just anathema to the CCP, as they just perceive it as, as weakening their hold on power or leading to the breakup of China. Um, and so for all their talk of a new authoritarian model and Singapore being the, the best example of this, it's, I think Singapore actually has proven the opposite. And so, yes, if you have a legal system, a strong legal system based on property rights, with an executive branch that is restrained, that's good for economic growth. I mean, who, who knew? Who could have predicted that? And so it is true that in China, if you travel far enough east, you will find cities that are similar in development to Singapore. But it's also true that if you travel far enough west, you'll find areas that are about as developed as North Korea. And so the other minor states. I think it's worthwhile here talking about some of the other small authoritarian states that have experimented with a kind of um, economic authoritarianism that seems similar to Singapore. So the United Arab Emirates and the other Gulf states are probably good examples of this. I mean, the UAE in particular, because it has this federalist model um, of different states that are allied uh, um, under a kind of a monarchy, which is basically, it, it's interesting in a way because the monarchy is very restrained because it exists within this federalist model, it's almost like a model of the early European states. And so it's been able to attract a great deal of foreign investment and has invested a lot of this into infrastructure. And obviously, a lot of this wealth comes from oil, but it's also a constitutional monarchy that's somewhat limited. And so the UAE and other countries like Qatar and Saudi Arabia even have moved to modernize infrastructure and strengthen legislation, uh, hoping to provide better standards of living for its people. Um, the country's still relatively corrupt and has very, very draconian blasphemy laws. But at least compared to other parts of the world, it's, it's somewhat of a model of economic development. So it's interesting that unlike industrializing countries and um, throughout most of history that had to tax their citizens to get state power, um, a lot of these countries in the Middle East basically just get their wealth from their oil, or they can just use nationalized industries to strengthen the state. And so Saudi Arabia, for example, doesn't have any taxes at all. Um, and so there's, you know, there's not a whole lot of demand for political representation because people don't have to pay taxes. Um, and so that's their model of development. And so these lobby states have been trying to reduce their dependence on oil money. 
and uh, create better infrastructure. So whether they'll succeed at all remains to be seen. Um, but I think, if anything, a lot of these Middle Eastern autocracies have proven that the better models of development are based on uh, a rule of law, legislative independence, property rights, and investment in public institutions, and education. China has actually, by contrast, shown an ability to create a very strong meritocratic system um, and create public institutions that work fairly well. I mean, one of the, the good things about China compared to other dictatorships is that China isn't a sort of family-based oligarchy because it has this long tradition of like the civil service exam and these, these sort of Confucian hierarchy so that um, China is not run by like 10 families. It, it has a fairly high turnover um, in terms of representation. Um, I mean, although you sort of have like the princeling faction and Xi Jinping, but apart from that, in the bu- there is like the bureaucracy. But you know, exactly how beneficial this is now that they have a dictator for life is sort of questionable. Um, Russia and Iran are actually w- ruled by corrupt oligarchies that have produced very little innovations in the way of a, a model that anybody would look to. Um, so the only other country that's sort of an authoritarian model that's worth mentioning probably is Vietnam, which is a very curious, it's in a very curious position of being one of the few nominally communist countries still left, um, but it has a far less repressive system than China and is much more economically free. Um, and it's completely ideologically opposed to China. Out of all countries in the world, it, when surveyed on favorability of China, Vietnam dislikes China the most. And I think this is because they were historically a province of China um, and ruled by them for a long time. Even the Chinese name for Vietnam, uh, Yunnan, which used to be Nanyu, means the, the southern province. Um, and also China has many, in recent history, tried to invade Vietnam, like in 1979 and has tried to as many conflicts with it over the South China Sea. Um, and so Vietnam is still a one-party socialist state, um, but has allowed independent representation and legislative elections since 2002. Although it's still very corrupt, and only a handful are actually, in reality, allowed to be elected. Um, but in a way, it's like because the government is not very interventionist, it's, it's allowed some economic prosperity, and actually Vietnam today is a lot like China was probably in the 90s and 2000s. Um, and so, but because they clearly are ideologically opposed to China, it might be that they continue to develop along those lines and eventually open up, um, one can only hope. But until then, we'll see.